All right, we're going to get started. Um, tonight's message is entitled Living Out of, not, you could say living out of the spirit realm, but I want to get more specific, living out of spirit. And this is an introduction. And they really go along, this will go along with Sunday morning um, as well. And so uh, before I get started, I want to just preface some things here. And um, Sunday morning I talked about, I think it was Sunday, that why is it so hard to see the manifestation, to bring it? We know what God has done for us. And um, why is it so hard for us to experience what the Bible says? is ours. So, um, you, you, we, can, we can use the terms objective, so I'll give you an example. Um, objective, and this will, make, this, will make, this will make a lot of sense. We've taught on this before, but um, I'm going to do it again. But you got objective versus subjective. You'll know what this means simply by if I have an apple that's an object. I can look at that apple all day long. We can pass it around, talk about the color of it. We can even cut it open and smell it, but it's still an object. When it becomes subjective is when you eat it and it becomes part of you. So we can talk about God, and we can talk about everything he's done for us, and that would be an objective truth. Like, he's the God that healeth thee. That's an objective truth. How do I make it subjective is when I experience that and I'm healed. Mm -hmm. And so everything that God has done for us in Christ, there's nothing more he can do. I'll even go so far as to say this, that God is not in the business of giving us things because he gave us everything mm -hmm. in Christ. So if he's not in the business of giving things, then the Holy Spirit is in the business of illuminating to us what he has given us and then we by faith so let's put this grace is everything he's given us freely our great faith is when our eyes are open to it revelation of it and we experience it and it's and it's his faith he, it's his grace it's his faith but everything is subjective objective until faith sees it and this is what we talked about last Thursday, I think it was, when we said, read the um, definition of faith, description of faith in Hebrews 11.1 1 in the Amplified. Faith, perceiving as real what is not yet known to the senses. So by grace it's given, faith, I see it, it's mine, and it becomes a reality. We become conscious of it, aware of it, and then we begin to partake of it. Um, your union in Christ is an established fact. Your part, but until you see that and make it subjective, until you are partakers of His divine nature. So, we'll do. Here's another one. Um, the presence of the Lord is everywhere, and you may sense it, and He may go. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's here. So it's objective in that it's here, but it's subjective as you Experience. experienced it. And he didn't. So you've made it subjective and you're still working on that or however your faith or your eyes, your uh, revelation of it or sensitivity to it. So a lot of times when you're saying, why am I not experiencing this? Then we doubt it because we're not experiencing it. So we begin to doubt it. And then we just walk away from it. Once you start doubting something, you then you start looking in other areas or whatever. But um, this is why he says, taste and see that the Lord is good. We can talk about the Lord, but until you taste and see. So, objective is we could sit here and teach and teach and teach and teach and teach. But subjective is we encounter it. We experience it. And so when you're saying, why aren't we manifesting? The fact that you're not manifesting, look at it through this lens, is that we may not have the the revelation of it, the awareness of it, the consciousness of that it's mine, that I can walk it out. So that's going to require seeing or a revelation. But once you see it, it's there. It, it, it becomes part of you. And then you can experience it. So we'll just put experience here. 
and and we can say we're going to teach it. We teach it in order to experience it. That makes sense. Yeah. And this is why. So you, what you don't want to do is say, well, it's not happening. It's not manifesting. I don't have dominion. I'm not ruling. I'm not reigning. I'm not. I'm not uh, healed. I'm not, for my, uh, you know, financial or whatever. And then we like, well, it doesn't work, or it's not true. No, you understand it is true, but you have to now have your eyes open to it, and the truth, the knowledge of the truth, is what makes you experience it. Not just having the truth told you; it's the knowing of the truth. It's when that truth becomes part of you, and you become part of that truth. The truth becomes a reality. Um, they encountered Jesus in the Old Testament. They talked about Jesus, so he was he was it was objective. They just talked about him, talked about him, the Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah. But when he shows up, they experience him and partake of him, and they encounter him, and uh, and the manifestation happens. So you got you got you, you got to realize that there's a there's a disconnect here. But it doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means we haven't seen it yet. We're working on having our eyes open. This is why Paul said that the eyes of your understanding would be opened. That you would know the truth and the riches and the glory, so forth and so on. All right. So we're talking about manifestation. We've got, we have to experience what he says is truth. We can teach it, but we've got to experience it, manifest it on earth as it is in heaven. So let's look at this. Got your outline? Um, we know all good and perfect things come from God who is spirit. So John 4, 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. So we just see here God is spirit. So what I want you to see is spirit. God is spirit. And then James says every good and perfect gift is where? Every good gift gift and every perfect gift. Everything comes from where? Inside. Above. And comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow or turning. Alright, so we, what I want you to see is that the source of the good and perfect is not earth. It comes from God who is spirit who dwells where? In, In us spirit. So we're spirit beings and we commune. Remember, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. If How am I supposed to worship him in spirit if I'm not spirit? Right? So spirit worshiping God who is spirit. Spirit to spirit. And that's just not worship. It's talking. It's communing. It's, it's having your eyes open. Spirit to spirit. We, uh, Paul says that we discern spiritual things um, talking spiritual things, discerning spiritual things from the Holy Spirit, and um, so it's spirit to spirit. So God who is spirit, so that means everything comes from spirit. It doesn't come from earth, because we're praying on earth as it is in heaven, right? That's what we're praying. And so what you're going to see in the Old Testament, if you haven't already noticed, that when you read the Old Testament, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find God manifesting good and perfect from heaven on earth and this is the things you're going to see you're going to see him manifesting his will and his good pleasure through men and women that he chooses so every time you read a bible story in the old testament you're going to find out he's he's god's going to show up god who is spirit from heaven is going to show up on earth and he's going to choose people to manifest his good and perfect will and it's from the source is from spirit to man. And then the Holy Spirit is going to come on these men and women that God chooses. So that like Elijah outrunning the chariot. He, he, he couldn't have done that on his own. So the Holy Spirit had to come on him. So God, God who is spirit, uses the Holy Spirit that sets on men and women in the Old Testament. Here's what you're going to find. God is going to always be invading darkness with his light. Every story is God manifesting the good and perfect gift on earth from heaven through men and women that he chooses to use in the Old Testament. You pick any story, you're going to see light overcoming darkness, good, conquering, evil. And that's God manifesting heaven on earth even in the Old Testament. 
Now here's the problem. Heaven and earth were never separated. And this is why God's doing this. See, man seems to think that it's separated, and it is to man in his darkness and his separation, which we're going to look at here quickly again using the same verses we've used several times. But God did not take, and I, I, you know, this is what I'm thinking. People have this idea that once Adam and Eve sin, God's like, I'm out of here. And then he just goes and leaves like a little boy who wants to play a game, and he has the toys, and, and they, go, they go pick somebody else, and God's like, I'm, I'm leaving like a little kid. I'm taking my toys, and I'm going home. And he just took heaven and went up there and left everything on earth like deism, that I'm just going to let earth take care of itself, and, and when I come back, I come back. Until then, it's like God winding up a clock, earth, creation, and then walking away. He didn't do that. All through the Old Testament, he's constantly interfering in man's affairs on earth. And when he does, it's heaven being exposed on earth. It's, it's heaven always and earth still coming together because in God's mind, he never separated it. So when you see God moving in the Old Testament, you see heaven moving on earth in the Old Testament because they're, they're in sync. It's, it's not separate. That just happened in man's mind. So man truly was never separated from God and neither was earth separated from heaven except in the mind. Here's the scriptures again to show you that. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, because of the enemy whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. So you have here that there's a blinding that took place in the beginning. Next verse. Having their understanding darkened, Adam and Eve and the rest of humanity, having blinded, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. It's simply they can't see and they don't understand, and therefore they perceived separation. Next. And they lit out that separation. And you who once were alienated and enemies, where? In your mind. God didn't declare Adam and Eve to be enemies. This is what they came up with in their own mind. And by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled. But anyway, you see that right there. I know we've gone through that, but I'm building something here tonight. Man's life becomes a lie and illusion because none of this is true. He's blind. He's darkened his understanding, and he's alienated himself from God and heaven. And therefore, everything he does from that point on is based on a lie, and then his life becomes an illusion, a lie in itself. So God sets up um, a tabernacle in the Old Testament where his presence could be. And the Hebrew people would look at that tabernacle, and their understanding was heaven on earth. That's what's what they would say. Heaven on earth. Now why would they say that about the tabernacle? So let's look at the tabernacle here. You have three places of the tabernacle. And I think Eva taught on that when I was mm -hmm. gone. Yeah. And I, I don't, she, did, she didn't want it recorded so I don't know exactly. I got the notes but I didn't really hear it. Just the, I have the notes. But anyway you have the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies. And why is it the Holy of Holies? Why is it called that? What piece of furniture was in there? The Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. What was in the Ark? The Ten Commandments, the Pot of Manna, the Aaron's Rod that budded. It was in that Ark. Three, three pieces. Then you've got the Holy Place. And that's where you had the lampstand and the, the uh, incense, the altar of incense, the lampstand, and the showbread, and... And all this represents Christ, by the way. All those represent Christ that's in there. And then you have the outer court. And um, this is the outside. Now what happens is, God is going to bring His presence on earth, which it never really left. Because God's everywhere. God's everywhere. So He, he, has, he designates a place... <coughs> And he would show up once a year, Holy of Holies, the Day of Atonement. He'd show up once a year, and, the, and this was such a holy place that the priests could not have any blemishes. They could not sweat in their underwear. 
I mean, because that represents rest and not work. And and because they never, there are times they never got it right. They'd have to tie a rope onto the priest with bells that he would have on him, and then a rope. And as long as they heard the priest doing the offering up the the, the, the sacrifice, the bells would move because he's working. He's moving around and he's performing the sacrifice. And as long as they heard the bells, he's passing mustard with God. But the minute that those bells stopped, something happened, and he died. And then they would take the rope and pull him out, because they're not going in. Only the high priest was allowed in there. So this is the Holy of Holies. This is the, the Shekinah glory, presence of God, resting in that part of the temple. And then you had the... Um, and this is also could be considered the inner court. Inner court, outer court, Holy of Holies, Holy Place, whatever you want to call it. Now... So God's presence would be right here. Now, I heard someone say, and, and, and I don't know, you can play with this. I think, it's, I think it's worth mentioning that if you would take your body and lay it over top of this diagram or alongside of it, you'd have your head, your body, and your feet. And the head, your spirit, mind, that communicates to God would, would, would be beside that your will and emotions mind so this is your spiritual mind and this is your will emotions your soul so this would be your spirit this would be your soul and the feet would be the outer the body that would touch earth so the outer court touched earth but not the inner but your, but your body does, your, so you're out. Now watch what, what, what happens here. So, so God, when he comes and he ministers from spirit, because God's spirit, ministering spirit to spirit, he is ministering out of, in your spirit and out of your spirit. Do I have that one verse next? John. What, what's, what's the next verse? John 14. Yeah. Now, at that day you will know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I in you. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So we know now that once Jesus comes, let me just back up a minute, because I'm getting ahead of myself here. Because God would not let man go, and he kept manifesting, because heaven didn't leave, he's manifesting heaven on earth, um, he would show up in a burning bush, he, would, he was the rock that followed Christ, Jesus was the rock that followed Christ or followed them in the in the wilderness, and um, so you can find even the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God rested on the Ark of the Covenant. So before God dwelt in the tabernacle, He would He you would find Him in objects that, that would be anointed, and something would happen that would come from that object, and then they would worship that object like the pole, and they'd have to get rid of it. But then God says, "No, I'm going to go from objects." And my presence is going to be found in a building. Um, the tent of meeting, or the tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle of Dave, or David, Solomon built. So, so this is the tabernacle there. And you got the presence and the spirit in there. Now watch. Then Jesus comes and he says, tear this temple down in three days I'll restore it. He's not talking about the building because now God goes from object to building to Jesus. Now the presence of God is in Jesus. You've seen me. You've seen the Father, right? right. See where God's moving yep. his, his presence because he's spirit. He can be on an object. He can be on people like Elijah who outran the, the chariot. He can be in a building. But then when Jesus comes, they are one and the same, yet distinct. And you've seen me. You've seen the Father. So then after Jesus dies, Paul comes and says, now you guys are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So now you are in Him. He's in you. Your life is hidden with Him. And you become the tabernacle. Now watch what happens here. So God, from the, God's Spirit and your spirit. I'll, I'll mention the scripture. I'm sure we'll get into it here. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Spirit working with spirit in union and you and they're not they're not separate. They're one yet distinct because you are who you are and God's who He is. But you're one. Now watch what happens. 
So God, when he, when, the whole thing is manifesting on earth as it is in heaven, which is in God's mind, in his spirit. He's trying to bring his perfect plan and will and purpose on earth through you. Okay, to you, through you. But it's got to go to you first before it goes through you. So the Spirit, your Spirit and God's Spirit is working together in the Holy of Holies. You become that holy, holy place now. Um, and then your mind and emotions are picking up on what God is saying, which are working together, renewing the mind. And then your feet is touching the earth. But before God can come bring anything on this earth, it's going to come through your Spirit. Your mind's going to pick up on it. Faith will come. And then you'll have the awareness and the consciousness of it, and you'll manifest it on earth. But you've got to remember, it, remember what I said earlier, objective versus subjective. Grace and faith go together. You can't just say everything's grace. There has to be faith. Your eyes open. Faith is a trust response to what God says he's going to do. But you've got to hear what he's saying, that he's doing, and you've got to see what he's already did. So you've got to have an awareness. And when, you're, when, you, get, when, when you see it, faith comes. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by seeing and getting the revelation. And then there's the awareness, the consciousness of it. And you now it becomes part of who you are. And now it works through you to manifest on earth. That healing will, will come this way. Finances will come this way. Deliverance. It's already, already done. So you can already say already done. But you have to be able to see it. You've got to be able to subjectively bring it in and make it part of who you are through revelation, through the faith, and then it becomes part and you begin to manifest it. You begin to experience it and walk it out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So God is always manifesting himself in Christ by his spirit through you on earth as it is in heaven. All right? So we are that temple now. Then we see God moving with his son into us, which are the scriptures we just looked at. And then now we become that walking, talking tabernacle, our bodies, ourselves. Okay? So God who is spirit speaks and communes with our spirit, our minds, soul, and, is, and then set apart to hear and know the Lord. And our outer body, our feet, are where we touch earth and manifest the inner to the outer. And mean, again, heaven on earth. Luke 17, 21, real quick, because this is all introduction, just to remind you. Um, yeah, probably they're all together, maybe. Just go to the next slide. Um, we'll go back to that. We'll go, go, go to the next one. Okay, right here. So the kingdom of God is within you. We know that. So, again, we take this diagram, put ourselves beside the tabernacle, and basically God puts... Christ in us, the kingdom in us. And then Ephesians 2, 6, and raises us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. So your spirit and his spirit are one. Heaven, him in heaven, you're on earth, together, sinking it all together, bringing it together in you as he did in Christ. And then you're seated in heavenly places. And look here, Philippians 3, 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, but it's also here on earth, wherever you find yourself at in what country. And then you have a citizenship, which is your who you've always been in Christ before the foundation of the world. And so here we are with heaven, we're in heaven, and we're in earth at the same time. And if you don't believe that, uh, an obscure scripture found in the King James Version in John chapter 3, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says something along the lines like this, because I don't have the uh, King James here tonight. But he says something like, The Son of Man who, who came down, who goes back up, who um, is on earth and is in heaven. Something along that, that line there in chapter 3 of John. And if Nicodemus, had, smart man that he was, had to go, Wait a minute. You're telling me that you're in heaven and you're on earth at the same time? Yeah. But so are we by these scriptures right here. The kingdom of God is within you. You're seated together in heavenly places. And your citizenship is in heaven. So you have um, a, a life, a, the source. You're in heaven, seated there. And your feet down here. And it's all God working through this. 
as a as a picture for you to maybe understand how his how his um, how he manifests, how he works through. Remember what we're talking about. The title tonight is living from spirit, not living from earth. Earth can't give you anything. Everything comes from spirit. Everything is God. God is spirit. Every good and perfect gift comes from spirit. So I should opened up with those two verses there. All right. So now here's the message. Think about the disciples, the 12 disciples and the Jews before Jesus came. What were they experiencing in Judea? What was life like before Jesus showed up? I want you to get the spiritual climate of, if you want to call it spiritual climate, I want you to get the climate, the religious um, culture of the tabernacle, okay? We're going back to the tabernacle here. Now watch this. In Matthew 23, and I'm not going to use the scriptures, but you can put Matthew 23 up there. This is the climate of the tabernacle in Matthew 23. Now, what I want you to do, Jesus is going to tell us what church looked like before he showed up and while he was walking the earth. Here's what I want to do, because God did this to me. Um, what did the disciples experience religiously? before Jesus showed up. I don't know that. Okay? You don't know that. But from Jesus' description in Matthew 23, we know by this description of the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes what it looked like before he showed up. And the 12 disciples knew and experienced this, this, this religious climate, if you will. So let's look at the first one if you're there at Matthew 23 in your Bibles. Um, we're going to look at verse 2. This is the first thing that he says. The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. So right off the bat, he's going to tell you who the players are. So these are who the people, in the Jews, and especially the twelve, who they had to deal with and stay away from. And you'll see why they didn't want to deal with them and why they stayed away from them. But right now he's telling you who the players are in verse 2. In verse 3, look what it says. Therefore, all that they tell you, the leaders, the, the religious leaders, all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. What do you call those kind of people? Hypocrites. So right off the bat, everybody knows they'll tell you to do it, but they're not going to do it. And so that's hypocrisy. That's what the church looked like, if you want to call it church, tabernacle, the ministry, the priests, the, the players of, of, of religion at that time. Next, verse 4. And they tie up heavy burdens, and they lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. That's verse 4. And that's all about legalism. Giving you things to do, have, putting a heavy burden on you. You can do it, and they're not even going to help you do it. They just expect you to do it. The next one, verse 5, look what it says. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels on their robes, and they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace and being called by men rabbi. So you see right there, they're full of ego and pride. Now do you want to, right off the bat, you see this. He sees it. They see it. This is not stuff that they, they hid. Everybody knew who the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes were. And they knew they were this way. And this is why these are fishermen. These are tax collectors. And they don't want a part of this. They, they, they don't want, in fact, when Jesus shows up and says, follow me, he doesn't take them to church. He doesn't take them to the tabernacle. You don't find John the Baptist. I did a thing, and maybe we'll teach on this again, but I did a thing that everything that God did before Jesus shows up, during the time that Jesus shows up, he does outside the city, outside the temple, and apart from the scribes and the, and the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. He's not part of that religious. And so, no, this is what church people, believers in God, 
This, is, this, is, this was the only place they could go, and look how corrupt these people are. So the climate, nobody, was, nobody would deal with these. these what, it gets worse. Watch. Let's jump down to verse 12. And whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and look what he calls them, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from men. So up to this point, they've shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. God comes, and what's he do with the kingdom? They're shutting them off. But God puts the kingdom in people in spite of them shutting them off. God's going to put the kingdom in people while they're trying to shut them off. God says, no, you can shut them off all you want. I'm putting the kingdom in them. Now watch. They keep people from the kingdom and the um, kingdom of heaven from men. For you do not enter in yourselves and you don't allow who are entering to go in. So they're not even, they're not even going in. And they're shutting people out. Woe to verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses, even while for a pretense you make long prayers, therefore you shall receive greater condemnation. So they're, they're ripping they're, the, 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 the um, victims. Their victims are widows. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel about on land and sea to make one convert, and when he becomes one like you, you make him twice as much the son of hell as yourselves. So when they do finally, they don't want, they didn't want those 12 guys. They're not going after fishermen. They're not going after tax collectors. They spit on tax collectors. These Pharisees will only find people that's like them. And then when they finally do get a convert, they make them twice as much the son of hell as themselves. And this is Jesus speaking. Drop down to 16. Woe to you blind guides who say whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold in the temple, he's obligated. So in other words, the temple is nothing, but ooh, that gold. You can, you, you can swear by the gold, but you, know, you can swear by the temple. That's nothing, but we you want to swear, you got to swear by the gold. Well, where's the, what's their value? Where's the focus here? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering that's on the altar, that is obligated. See, again, it's, the, it's not about the altar, it's about what's on the altar. It's not about the temple, it's about the gold that, that, that makes up the temple. Then look at verse 19. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? So it's the altar that sanctifies the offering. So in other words, their value system is upside down. Therefore, he who swears, swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple, swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it, which is God. And he who swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and him who sits upon it. Then you go down to verse 23. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint and dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. So here they're just, they're majoring on the minors and not, and, and not the, the other way around. So he's saying, you, you're, you're getting to pick to choose what you, what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Um, so, but look at verse 24. You blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Now think about that. This is the climate of the religious leaders that represent the temple. That everybody is supposed to be part of and love and all. No, they don't want to go. These guys have made this a den of thieves. The, te the temple, a den of thieves. And they are corrupt and so when you, in other words, it's just, and, and what I saw in this, this is why I'm doing this, is because I see a major part of the church still being this way. You could see this stuff happening in churches today and the way, and I could go through this whole thing again. I'm just telling you what Jesus says. But we can say, well, this means, I can show you what they're doing, that they, these guys did, but they're doing it another way. But let me move on here. In Matthew 7, 3 through 5, it says they would focus on the speck in your eye while they have a plank in yours. So they're going to come after this little problem you have while they got major crises and major scandals going on behind the curtains in their own life and in church. And they're worried about the little speck and they got a scandal going on in their life. 
Okay, verses 25 to 27, you go on. He says, um, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. Then he goes on to say, verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanliness. So in other words, they're just all about appearance. If they can make themselves look good, it didn't matter what their heart was like, it didn't matter what their thoughts were going, they didn't matter anything. All they were concerned about was the outside appearances. And so um, you see that going on. And you can't tell me these people didn't see that. No one respected these guys. They feared them because they were the temple people. They were the priests. They were the scribes, you know. But they didn't want to go around them, and they would walk away from them. If you would see one coming, you'd walk around. Self-righteous, Luke 18, 11, um, where that guy is praying in the temple, and there's this other guy, and he says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this bum, this, this sinner, this, this, that, and the other, as if he has no problems himself. So you see this self-righteousness going on. All this was happening within the tabernacle and among the players in and outside of the tabernacle. This was the state of affairs. This was the state of the union, if you want to say Jesus has given them the state of the union, the state of the temple, the state of the priest. And it's a horrible existence. And this is what he's saying to them in Matthew 23. Look at all the woes and hypocrites and, and, and things that he's thrown at them. Now, Jesus will come along now. Now, let's say, now, now again, I, I gave you what he said was going on while he was there, but this was going on before he shows up. I hope I can explain this right. This is how, I got, this is how the Lord showed it to me. So I, I wanted to say, okay, before Jesus showed up, what did these guys think about the temple, the priests, and the Pharisees? And Jesus is going to tell us what they thought because this is what everybody saw them be like. Okay, so now you got that. That's the picture that Jesus shows up. This is the religious climate of Judea, Jerusalem. And, and the twelve and the Jews had to put up with this. This is what they had. This was their religion, and they weren't happy about it. And these were the players. So Jesus shows up and says what? Come, follow me. And he doesn't lead them to the temple. He doesn't lead them to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He goes to the common man in the streets, not to the temple. God moves his, just like Moses, God moves his glory outside the camp. Jesus is the glory of God, and he's not going to the Pharisees. Now, he'll, 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 he'll bump shoulders with them to correct them, to give them a to open their eyes, call them out on their hypocrisy, and you're going to see what ends up happening here in a minute. Now watch. Jesus is not excluding these guys. He's not writing them off. He is trying to open their eyes, and I'll prove it to you by looking at verse 37 and 38 of Matthew 23. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to you. How often I, Jesus, wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. So he would go to these guys periodically, go to the temple, he'll go to the Pharisees and he'll get into a fight with them, you know, over, over God and sacrifices and Sabbaths and so forth and so on. He says, um, verse 38, Behold, because you're unwilling, behold, your house is being left to you desolate. So what's he saying there? Until your eyes are open and you see me for who I am and you come to me and follow me as these twelve are doing and others, you're left to your own devices. You're left to your illusion. You're left to the sin you have um, bought into because of the lie and now the life you live is an illusion and you are left your life is left desolate without me apart from me he says you can do nothing in John 15 and what he's saying is I'm coming to I'm coming to seek and to save that which is lost but you don't think you're lost it's like the prodigal until he comes to himself he's going to do the riotous living so his house is left to him desolate 
This is not Jesus discarding these Jews, these Pharisees. He's trying to bring them in, but he's, going to, but he's speaking truth to them in a way that he's not speaking truth to the twelve, because the twelve not acting like these guys. So Jesus is, is almost like when he shows up like the one guy. Sell everything you have and come follow me. Well, I don't see him telling anybody else that. Everybody gets a tailor-made invite based on who they are and what illusion they're living and what lie and sin they've become a part of that he's bringing them out of. Does that make sense? Remember the guy that was born blind. Um, and Jesus said, Be healed and go and sin no more lest something worse happens to you. Remember he says that? Go and sin no more lest something worse happens to you. Now, I think this is in John 9. But what people and legalists have taken that. See, you go out there and sin, something bad is going to happen to you. Well, you have to understand, what does sin mean? Sin in the Greek is harmatia. It means to fall short of the glory of God. When did man fall short of the glory of God? In the garden. When he partook of the, ap, the, the tree, whatever fruit it was, when he partook of that tree, in his separation, he fell short. When he lost his identity is when he fell from the glory of God. He, he had fallen short of the glory of God. He meant another word, he missed the mark. He's no longer um, on the same level that he, he was created to be. He fell into a lower level of a state based on his um, screwed up mindset, darkened his understanding, he now is falling short. And what happens once Adam and Eve fall short? Sin. All kinds of crap starts happening in the world. To them, to their, Cain kills Abel, and so forth and so on. So when Jesus says to this guy, you, I have made you whole, it's not just his eyesight, he's giving him back his identity. As a son of God. And he's saying, I've made you whole now. You're, 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 you, I'm, I've come that you would be a new creation. Now, don't go and fall back to the old identity, falling short, sin. He's not talking about sins. He's talking about falling short. He says, you need to transcend. Remember we talked about transcending? Mm -hmm. We're always transcending. Well, Jesus made him whole and took him out of the old and brought him into the new. Hey, this is the old man dying and the new man coming in. And so when he says go and sin no more, lest something worse happens. Because the only thing that can happen to us in a, in a, with a false identity is that we screw ourselves up because we think we're something we're not. We, cre we continue the illusion of sin. And so he says, look, I'm giving you new identity. If you fall back from this identity into a lower false identity, which you've had all this time, that thus the blindness, physical and spiritual, you go back, knows what, remember we talked about wrath as a metaphor of what? Consequences of sin. You go to Romans 1, and so it says he gave them over, and um, that means he, look, if you, if you want to separate from me, and you eat from this tree, he warned them you would die, and then it un would unleash every evil that the world has to contend with today, so if you don't go with your identity and you fall back into that false identity, the old way of living, you can expect some crap to happen because you're going to make choices that are going to come back and bite you you know where. So you, you, you have to understand what Jesus is coming. And then that makes sense then when he says, go and sin no more. Don't be that old man um, lest you start living that way again in a fallen state of missing the mark falling short of the glory of God, harmatia, and you become that illusion again, living that life of illusion again, and then sin, and who knows what you're going to get yourself into. We've all gotten ourselves into some stupid stuff because of, because of not knowing who we really are. All right, but anyway, where are we at? Um, so, so the picture, going back to the tabernacle, or the temple, now go to Galatians 2.20. You had that one up. Now I want to show you something here, and I'm done. This, is, this, this one is going to really show you something. And I know we've looked at this scripture a million times, but you've got to see this. Paul, this, he's getting his identity. 
He's getting a revelation that he is no... I have been crucified with Christ. That's the death of the old, the old identity. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I. I'm not that guy. Remember Galatians 1.16. Christ ch chose me, set me apart from my mother's womb to unveil Christ in me, which is his identity because he's one with Christ. When you're one with Christ in union, you, you partake of his identity. Now watch, he says, it's no longer I. That it, this, this, this I no longer, this lower level living, this, this old identity, it wasn't me. I bought into a lie, so it's no longer I. Who lives? But Christ lives in me. Now watch, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who lives in me. So it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. Now, um, I don't know what version that is, but it says, Yet not I, but Christ lives in me is a better, better translation. I can't remember which one this one is. But he's saying, I still live, but not out of the old identity. I'm living now in the identity of Christ that I'm one with and in union with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. He has to now see his life as Christ. I gave you the Colossians 3.3. 3. My life is hidden in him. My life is in him. He is in me. John 14.20. We looked at that one too. Now watch what happens here. What is Paul, what revelation is he getting here? Alright, now, um, looking in the notes now, he says it's no longer I. Man in his darkened mind, false identity, alienated from God in his mind, looks like the Pharisees, and what they did to the temple in their separation. This is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Right here. This guy right here, Paul. So when he says, it's no longer I, put a pause there. Who are you, Paul? Who were you? It's Matthew 23. This, these, the old I is what manufactured the horribleness of the temple and its practices with these men. This was done out of a fallen state, out of a false identity. They thought they were great. Paul says, I was a Pharisee. That I outdid them all. This, so this I produced that climate that I'm talking about. And Jesus, who is who? Who's Jesus? God. Right? Who is God? Spirit. So watch this. When Jesus, you got to get this. I, I mean, I, I've labored to bring you to this point. Hopefully I haven't bored you with a lot of repeats, but look where we're going to go here. So listen carefully. So Jesus shows up as God. God is spirit. Jesus comes as spirit in human flesh to reveal to us God that we've never known and seen before, who is spirit. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, so when Jesus shows us the Father... He's showing us spirit in the flesh. What we saw in the tabernacle is not spirit in the flesh, but that which is born of the flesh is flesh. We see earth, we've seen the heavenly, heaven on earth become earth, nothing but earth. They thought you know, in the Old Testament this was heaven on earth because of the ark, the presence of God. But when these guys in the old eye of Paul, Identity took over, the illusion screwed up the whole system that God had, and so Jesus shows up as God, who is spirit, in the flesh, and the way Jesus operated was out of spirit in his flesh, his humanity. Does that make sense? If it doesn't tell me, I'll say it again. Jesus is God, God is spirit, God in Jesus, God who is spirit in Jesus, shows up in the flesh and shows us on earth what spirit looks like. Because prior to this, if I said to you, and let's say we were the 12, Jesus never showed up yet, and we got this to look at and deal with, and we don't want any part of that, I'm just going fishing. I, don't want to, I, I, I believe in God, but I ain't, I ain't touching this or these people. And if I asked you, you were Peter, I said, Peter, what is spirit? No idea. I don't know what spirit looks like. It's invisible. 
It's, it's, I guess we are spirit beings, but I don't know what that looks like. Well, Jesus says and shows up and says, I am, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is spirit, and everything that I am and that I do is what spirit looks like. And everything that I accomplish is by that same spirit. spirit. Does that make sense? So we're spirit. We're spirit. Okay, well, he breathed into us, we're spirit. And so he who is joined to the Lord, I don't know, when we're going to get to that, what's next? Which one is it? First Corinthians 6, 17. Because this, this is a key verse. There's all kinds of scriptures saying that we're spirits. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So spirit and spirit. All right? Now, here's what I want to say to you. And you said it. We are spirit. What does that look like? We wouldn't have a clue if it wasn't for Jesus showing us what it looks like to be Jesus. And what it looks like to be Jesus, who is God, who is spirit, is what we look like. We are the offspring. We have the DNA. We are created in His image and likeness. So we are spirit, partakers of His divine nature, one with Him, spirit beings, in a fleshly body, as Jesus was a spirit who came down in a fleshly body and worked through it. Now Jesus now comes into us after the resurrection and as spirit works and unites with us, again, he who is joined the Lord's one spirit, John 14, and that day you know I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, I'm in you. You get that union going on there. And now we know what the spirit now looks like because we know what Jesus looks like because he revealed to us what, who the Father is. And now we know who the Father is. So everything about God is spirit. And Jesus brought that spirit into human flesh, 100% God, 100% man, and manifested on earth what, the, what started in spirit, what always originates in spirit. That's why he'll say we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. That's why Peter says you have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. This means God is not in the giving business. The fact he gave you the spirit and then he put his spirit with your spirit joined together as one. Everything on earth has to come out of spirit. So when, when I say you have everything and he's not giving you anything because everything you have is already in you by way of spirit. So now what you have to do again Here's where the presence of God was, and it worked through to the holy place, to the outer court, and out. Now, here's one for you. If you go to Ezekiel, and you'll find that out of the temple flowed what? A river. But it originated in the temple, and, and it came out of the temple, and Ezekiel said it started with my ankles, it went to my knees, it went to my hips, and then I was floating in it, and then I was swimming in it, because it's, it's just the abundance of everything that came out of the Spirit manifesting on earth. But then Jesus comes along and says, you're the temple, and out of your belly flows what? Rivers of living water. From where? My gut? That's 20 pounds overweight? No. This, these rivers of living water is coming out of my spirit, where God is, who I'm partaking of Christ's divine nature. So what we've got to see here, and this is, this is a huge disconnect between something being objective and subjective, is that we keep looking for answers from the earth. Mm -hmm. We keep trying to figure out how to shoot, troubleshoot something with our mind. And I don't know who I was saying, I say a lot of things to people, but I was saying to somebody, all it takes is one word of God hmm. that you get to turn a situation upside down, right side up. Not you, okay, okay, go, I'm going to go talk to this guy. What would, he, what would you do if you were in my shape? What would you do if you were in my position? Well, I've got this going on. What would you do? And, you, and, you, and you're soliciting advice from every Tom, Dick, and Harry. And all God has to say is one word. Show you one dream, have one vision, and supernaturally, out of your spirit, manifest something that you can't produce in your own flesh and blood. But we keep, we keep religion keeps reverting to methods. Keys, secrets, working a system, working the earth. And we're not supposed to work the earth. We're supposed to live out of the spirit. And living out of spirit is what's manifesting on earth that we are part of what God's doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So go back to uh, Galatians 2.20 here. Now let me finish this up. I have been crucified with Christ. Paul saying, I ain't that guy. I am not that guy. That guy died. That guy who, who amen what they were doing, that, that's from that false self. That's from that lie and illusion. We created a religion. We hijacked God's, we hijacked Judaism, Judaism and created this, this counterfeit of it because of the, 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 the horrible eye that we were lied to and deceived by the enemy with. So he says, I no longer live, yet not I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in new creation, new, new identity, I live in the flesh, as I'm still here on earth to manifest heaven, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, and the faith of, so that's why this is the King James, faith of, not in, take that in, out, and put of, that's a wrong translation, faith of the Son of God, because it's not our faith, it's His, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Now, this is what happened to Paul. Paul is saying, I'm taking that old identity, it's dead, and my identity now is Christ in me. Hope of glory. That's the um, Colossians 1.27. Now watch this. I don't think I have scriptures for this. John 3.30. Do I have John 3.30? I think I do, yeah. One, one sentence. Uh, I don't see it. It'll say, I have increased, decreased. No. Okay, John 3.30 says, I must, this is John. Now, let me, give you the, let me give you the context. The disciples of John go up to him, John the Baptist, and say, Hey, that guy you said was the Messiah, remember him? Yeah. He's baptizing more people than you. You're the baptizer. We've called you John the Baptist. And, you, and, and now this guy's baptizing. He's, he's taking our business. We're no longer the, the main players anymore. And John says, I, well, first of all, he says, What's, what doesn't come from heaven isn't mine. I mean, that's huge. John says, if God's not doing it, why do I want to be a part of it? If it doesn't come from heaven, I don't want anything to do with it. And, and then pointing to Jesus, he says, I must decrease so that he can increase what's happening you go back to the Galatians it's no longer I I decreased I died I died so that he can increase yeah John 3 30 he must increase but I must decrease now what's happening here it's an exchange from a, um, a false identity to a new identity John caught that Man must put aside the old eye and see himself as the new creation, the new man, the new eye, the resurrection in Christ, one who's in union called newness of life. And then he puts on the new man and he puts on Christ. I got a couple of scriptures for that next, I think. Right after that. Just give me what's next. If then, the, if then you were raised with Christ, Seek those things which are where? Above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. So right there it is. For you died. You can't set your mind on things. That's the old, the old identity worked that earth and produced an illusion called sin. Not on things of the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life. See, see that it's not me. Is no longer I. My identity is now in Him. Here's what, here's what we have to come to. This is where we make it subjective. Is that when I say, hey, I'm, my name is Greg, but in reality I realize I am Greg and Christ together. You, I might say I'm Paul, but Paul knew he was one with Christ. And his identity would be that. Thus they called them Christians. That's the whole purpose of calling them Christians. Christians was that they were their identity was in Christ and that who I am is him who I am is him yet I live but I live him I live him this is my identity spirit I live spirit 
out of spirit with a renewed mind of come, what comes out of my spirit, my mind gets renewed, and it gets, and once it becomes in my mind, it gets renewed, it becomes subjective, and it becomes, it just becomes manifesting on earth, which is as in heaven. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So who we are is spirit. Having minds renewed, having the mind of Christ, and having our minds renewed, we manifest as our awareness and our consciousness a new way of seeing living as sons, as divinity, as we always been before the foundation of the world. We're moving as spirits from the holy... Now watch, we're moving as spirit, spirit beings from the holy of holies out of the identity of Christ on earth. If you want to put, again, using that diagram there. We're moving as spirits from the holy of holies, us as the temple, through our bodies within the natural realm to manifest on earth as it is in heaven, in other words, boots on the ground. That's what we do. God is spirit in our soul, mind, emotions, and will, and in our bodies. Our bodies are the connection to the natural realm. Our bodies are the result of our spirit. We are complete. That what's true on the inside has to be true on the outside. Okay, now here's where I want to close with this one too. Is that you can't tell me, and you got to listen to this one. You can't tell me what is going on in your spirit will never ever hit your soul and manifest in your body. That makes zero sense. So he's the healer within, but your body's still sick. He's the provider within who can multiply bread and fish, but it never comes out and, and manifests in any way in your body or in the lives of others. The whole purpose of the kingdom of God being inside of us, the whole purpose of God saying, I'm putting heaven in you, Spirit to spirit. Your sp is so that he can take heaven, the kingdom of God, Christ in us, and manifest it through us into this earth. And your body is not going to experience that. Of what? So in other words, what I'm saying is what's true in your spirit has to be true in your body. And you got to make sure, again, if you're looking at yourself as a spirit soul body is that your mind has to be renewed to who and what the spirit is who you are inside who you were in spirit before the foundation of the world the mind has to see it it has to become subjective the mind has to see it in order to experience it not just again I could teach this then we're stuck here on the objective side but when the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to this then you taste and see that this is true, this is good, it becomes subjective, and then the flow begins to happen. Healing in your starts in your spirit, and you're already healed. If you've got, you got a physical ailment, you're already healed. But there's a consciousness, and there's an awareness that you have to see. And when you see it, and you encounter it, and you experience it out of your spirit, through your mind, the body has to fall in line with what the spirit is. Here's, here's what I'm saying. What's going on in your spirit has to go on your body in order to manifest on earth. It's not going to bypass the feet and then zip over into the ground. It has to go through your body. Your body has to experience everything that's going on in your spirit. It was never the, 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 the makeup of man, the tripartite of man, is never to be body, soul, spirit. It's supposed to always be in harmony. The fall, the lie separated us. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, we, we divide it here to make sense, but it's not divided. It's like a paradox. You know, it's, 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 it, it is separate, but it's not. But we separate it so that you will understand that flow. Just like he separates these three things, so you understand the holy holies, the holy place, and this, the outer court. Well, we separate this, but it's not, you can't separate the temple. You, so when you walk by, you said, there's the temple. If you walk by and said, there's the tabernacle, you didn't go, oh, look, there's the holy holies, there's the holy place. There's No, you saw, like a tree. You don't go, oh, look at those branches. You say, look at that tree. tree. So I look at you as human. I don't look at you as body, soul, spirit. But you are in, in harmony, flowing together, united, and yet distinct, but yet not. I can't explain it, but I do know I have a spirit. 
can't, too many scriptures that I have a spirit. And I also know that my mind needs to be renewed. And I also know that I have the mind of Christ, which is in my spirit. And I also know that I have a body that it's not manifesting what's in my spirit, which is the kingdom of God. So, you know, we've taught on this, but I'm telling you, when you don't keep this renewed, it's easy to get away from. Yep. God's design for the church, Christ the head, you the body, one, to have an awareness to this new and living way, Hebrews 10, 12, 20 and 21, live out of the spirit and manifest it in and through your bodies. And then you're going to start seeing Acts 17, 6, where it says the disciples turned the world upside down because the kingdom is just breaking out. Once you get the awareness and the consciousness of this thing working in you, you won't be able to stop it. It'll break out. The kingdom will break out on earth as it did with Jesus. You can't stop what Jesus was doing. And Jesus didn't stop doing the He said greater works than these shall we do. But we've got to get this objective and subjective thing going, working it together. The truth and the experience of the truth and then manifesting it through who we are as spirit in our bodies. Any questions, comments? The key is, is seeing it. You know, we can all see ourselves defeated or sick and in it. Walk, that's why I said Sunday, walk by sight but not by faith. Yeah, but that's our problem. We mm -hmm. can see the and it's easy to be sick because you can see yourself sick. See, but, you, sick. And, but you need to see yourself before you can experience the, the healing. Um, another thing is most of the church hate to say it is still living out of Matthew 23. Yeah. Yeah. But that's why, you know, I thought, you know, Jesus, and I didn't finish what the Lord showed me. Since you brought that up, I'll tell you where all this went for me was that, you know what, I see religion still popular, I see people still, churches, denominate, everything's still so religious. And um, the I didn't die. It, it, it's still the false identity, the religious identity is still out there eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But here, I came to the conclusion is, Lord, I just want to be a follower of Jesus. That's what this whole thing was about for me, and I thought, well, I'll bring this piece to you. But since you mentioned that, I'll just tell you where this thing, this thing he showed me. I said, you know what? I don't want nothing to do with any of that. Now, I'm not anti-church. Okay? I'm not. Um, but, I just, I, uh, but I want to be a follower of Jesus. And then he can place me and we can do what we do community-wise, church-wise. But I will never follow man. I'll never follow the institution. I'll never follow the building. I'm going to follow Jesus. Because that's who I am. I can, that's who I am. My identity is him. So, I, so why not follow him? Yes. That's my identity. The minute I stop following him, I'm going to have an identity that's, that's, that's marred by whatever I'm looking at. I'll become what I hear, what, what, what community, what culture, what they say. Or I'm going to, This is why Romans 12, he said, don't let the world mold you, squeeze you into its image, into what it, what's the fashion you after. Because that, that would be a, a, a bad identity. But renew your mind on who you are in your Him. As He is, so are we. Father, we bless You. We thank You. We don't understand this completely. No one claims to understand it. But we're looking through a glass darkly and we're seeing clearer and clearer as we see this. Paul says, I haven't apprehended it. I, 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 I haven't obtained it completely. But I press on to know you, that I may know him. Because as we know him, we know ourselves. Because we are one with him, never separate, never apart. Our identity is him. Amen.